I was very honored um, to be invited to introduce um, Professor Mary Ellen um, and, and let me just note a couple of things. Um, Mary Ellen Tucker is known as one of the key founders of the, move, of the discipline of religion and ecology as it now exists in this country and the world. Um, she has worked tirelessly to birth this discipline. Um, one of the major um, moments, or birthing moments, was just over 20 years ago when she and John Grimm, her husband, created a series of conferences at Harvard. I think it was 10 conferences, one in each of the world's great religious traditions and ecology. So Islam and ecology, Judaism and ecology. If you haven't seen the volumes that came out of those, take a look at those volumes. Tremendous resources. She, I was just going through my mind to, to name a couple of the ways in which she has been so instrumental. She was actually a student and friend of Thomas Berry and has helped to bring his work into the public sphere. She recently co-produced a film called Journey, Journey of the Universe. How many have seen that film? Okay, great, with Brian Swim. If you haven't seen it, do see it and, and make use of it. She was instrumental in the Earth Charter, in many of the statements by some of the world's great faith traditions regarding ecology and religion, in UN projects. Um, it, she has been involved in the ecological civilization movement in China um, that is very much being adopted by the Ministry of the, of the Environment in China. And I won't go through many, about, many other things, but I will say two things that mean a lot to me. And one is that in recent years, she has exercised influence in moving religion and ecology as a discipline to be much more sensitive to the vital issues of race, class, gender justice. <coughs> that is significant. And then finally, I would just say that she is also a tremendously generous and gracious and non-ego-centered uh, nurturer of other people and their powers. And I have seen that time and again over the years. And for that, I am most grateful. So it is with great, um, it is with, with joy that, that I find her here. And, and I ask you to, with real um, gratitude, welcome this woman in our midst. Uh, 
Um, and so that, I just wanted to flag that from the very beginning, but also to return to the fact that um, when Nixon came into office and I'd been working for the, the McGovern campaign, and we could see things were happening uh, that were <laughs> very illegal, I said, I'm leaving the country. And I went to Japan. Uh, I taught there for two years, traveled extensively in Asia, which changed my life, um, clearly. But it was also a sense in Japan and in Asia of a cosmic sensibility that really opened me up through the traditions, through the culture, through the landscapes, and so on. And I want to also reinsert that into our discussions and our thinking. Because sometimes people say, oh, cosmology, it's way up there in the air. It's not. It's right here in a beautiful walk I just took this morning on the Berkeley campus with this splendid redwood country. This is really redwood country. You know, <clears throat> they light up deep time. Nice. They light up wonder, which brings us towards gratitude, which is Kusumita was just saying, bring us towards transformation and action. See, that's what the cosmological approach can do. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that. And we live in a living universe. It's right here, in cities, in countryside. It's not a romantic nature idea, and it's a source, perhaps, of some of our greatest transformative energies for not just a sustainable future, but a flourishing future. I like to say to John, my husband, I don't want to just have a sustainable relationship, I want to have a flourishing relationship, <laughs> right? And so this, we have to get new language to bring this forth, and so the religions can help us to do that with their vital sensibilities. Uh, their cosmological sensibilities, their ecological attunement, their rituals, and so on. So, and putting before us what Japan did was open up this cosmological sensibility. Um, certainly Teilhard de Chardin did as well, and Thomas Baird. But it also opened up this tremendous sense of Earth concern, of these amazing landscapes. Two-thirds of the world's people are in Asia, you know? Amazing landscapes in 73, 74, when I went there, there's nothing like that anymore, practically. You know, this is a great imprint of humans. The Anthropocene has exploded. And India and China are going to change the face of the planet. They already are. Our tar sand oils in Canada went to China. Uh, the absolute transformation of a billion plus people looking for the fruits of modernity. What is justice on that scale? That is a huge question. But those of us in ancient studies at Columbia, where I studied tremendous uh, scholars of Asian studies, but we could all see this horizon beginning <laughs> to foreshorten the possibilities of planetary life as <coughs> this, these two great cultures and civilizations wanted to <coughs> participate in their own part of <coughs> modernity. So that's justice on a planetary scale, right? Um, and then I think then this cosmic Earth human sensibility that we need to line up, that's what the tradition of Confucianism does that I've studied for many, many years, saying that the human completes the cosmic and Earth processes. So that's a bit of what I'm offering it with these comments today, that we need this broader context for sustainability. So we need this flourishing of life, our own, but the whole Earth community. And that term, even Earth community, is one that Thomas Berry offered to say, we're in reciprocal relations with ecosystems, with species, with other people, with with Oakland, with Harlem, it said the first community brings us all together. And a very powerful image of our collectivity. And we are beginning to get, in many forms, the expression of this. Certainly the most rich one, I would say, is the Pope's encyclical, by Bata C. begins with praise be. You see, that's the instinct of humans, praise. Joy, thanksgiving, gratitude. Um, and he's saying, if we light that up, 
will have when he's speaking of integral ecology, people and the planet, eco-justice. That's an expression of a movement that's been more than 20 years with many of you in this room. We have a, a book series from Orbis Press, Ecology and Justice. And at AAR this year, we're going to do a workshop to elevate this kind of discussion. But we have it moving from the uh, Parliament of World Religions, because Amita has been a tremendous leader in that area. And the next parliament in Toronto will also help to integrate these discussions that we're having with the different world religions into justice and peace, I hope. Um, and I would also just say the Earth Charter that was mentioned by Cynthia is an expression of where we need to go. Namely, not a declaration of independence, but a declaration of interdependence. Beginning with, we're part of a vast evolving universe. That's the beginning of the Earth Charter. Earth itself is alive with a myriad community of life. And when native peoples in 1997 in Rio, the Earth held up the first draft of the Earth Charter, when they saw their worldview in this charter, weeping, crying, rejoicing. Because I would suggest that is what is missing, a sense that this is not a dead universe, a dead Earth, a living universe, a living cosmology. And perhaps one of the most striking expressions of that in our time, in the last year, has been Standing Rock. The notion of water protectors, it's a transformation of consciousness, you see. It's, it is a sense that that began with prayer, with fire services, with the next generation really beginning that whole process, unbelievable spiritual, ecological, and cosmological process. Position. This is a water planet. That's a cosmological reality. Of course, we know there's probably water on other planets, and that's fine. But this is what defines this planet, you see? So they were opening up that space for indigenous peoples from all over the world to say, yes, this is our sense of a living earth. Why were we all drawn into it? Not only because it was a politically amazing movement, but because it was a cosmologically, ecologically, spiritually grounded movement, such as we have never seen on the North American continent of that size and scale. Its efficacy will go on, despite whatever courts do. It is so compelling. So, I'm saying, on the one hand, there's these signs, you see, of things that are emerging, that link up cosmology, ecology, um, and justice. But I want to also take the step back and say, we know that we are part of a broken world, a very broken world. And how do we face that? How do we draw it in? How do we begin our mornings? I begin my mornings by prayer with water in four directions. So it's drawing this sensibility in. What are the gifts that keep our life going? Earth, air, fire, and water, as Chris Chappells has been working on, work on this, but all the world's religions have the sense of the elements that keep life alive. So if we recognize and face it as clearly as we can that we are in, at the most broken times, that humans have ever seen in 150,000 years of being human, then the spiritual energies of the world's religions are going to be hugely important. But we also have to define why are we in a broken world. And in part, because we have a broken dream. That is a dream that, for better or for worse, was birthed on this North American continent, an American dream that said prosperity and progress were one that happiness was defined by material goods. And that is a dream that has exploded around the world to India and China and so on. Dubai, the Emirates, if you've ever been there, seven inches of water a year, golf courses, <coughs> pools, the most incredible consumption you can imagine, and people from all over Asia in horrible living conditions building these hotels, restaurants, etc. 
talk about an example of inequity and a dream on math, truly math. So <clears throat> we've got to highlight why we're in this mess. It's not just in Washington, D.C., which exemplifies it on a grand scale, right? And people actually grasping for the last straws of this American dream of rabid materialism. Absolutely rabid. It's all over the world. That's what our story has given people. And the power of story is incredible. You see? So, happiness and material self-sufficiency, that's all about sustainable development. But the real summit was, how do we reconcile environment, economic development? That's fine. That's in a model, OK. When it explodes into wealth with no limits, economic growth with no sense of moderation, we're in a big, big mess. And the only, not only, but the resources of the different world's religions as an antidote to that are perhaps one of the most powerful energy sources we have in a period that's looking for sustainable energy. We have sustainable energy. We have solar. The Chinese are way ahead. The Indians are way ahead on new technologies. Germany is way ahead. We have a slew of alternative energy, but we do not have the spiritual transformative energies of sustainability. And they will come from the religions or the spiritual, whether spiritual, religious, etc., not exclusively from secular and humanistic perspectives too, but it's an energy we need to yeast into this movement of sustainability because it is on the perimeter. Every international movement is about schemes. Did you love the term? <laughs> schemes. <laughs> How are we going to regulate carbon emission. So it's a mechanistic model. It's a policy model that's very reductionistic. And you can have side events at the top conferences of religious leaders and so on. So it's really not central. <coughs> so our challenge is five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we need to have this yeasted in to the center of these discussions. So that we're not just at GTU or Yale or, or the New School, etc. And I think in the New School's recent conference on the Himalaya region was a great example of this intersection. So it's happening. I'm, I'm not pessimistic, but I'm just challenging all of us. And that challenge is how do we get a language that is going to translate out of this room into policy groups, uh, NGO groups, who've been working at this for a long, long time. And they're like, oh. Religious communities, yeah, we've been at this for 25 years. <laughs> and all of a sudden, religions come in with rhetoric, with a sense of their own importance. We've got to have humility as we join the rest of the Earth community in these efforts. But it is a, it's a missing link, the spiritual, ecological sensibility in a broken world with a broken dream. We have something to offer if we can do it with clarity, with humility, with synergy, uh, with what's already there. So this new dream, um, not exclusively one, not maybe exclusively new, but people are driven by dreams. They are driven by stories. Every time someone told a story up here, everyone was listening. <laughs> so interesting. Um, but how are we going to evoke a sensibility? that in the Anthropocene, <coughs> we are going through an hourglass of mass extinction of species and cultures and language. How are we going to go through what E.O. Wilson describes as an hourglass of extinction? <coughs> Get up each morning and say, we have something to contribute. We have to confront not only the dream, the the problem of a dream gone awry. The source of that dream gone awry, if we take it down one more level, materialism. Now, we can say materialism over and over again, and having good stuff, and a house, and so on. Again, there's sufficiency, and there's excess. We need to find these two types of things. 
But one of the suggestions um, that I'm offering this morning is materialism can be redefined, and there's all kinds of movements trying to do that. One is religion and ecology, in fact. There's others coming out of philosophy, new materialisms, vital matter. Um, and then there's things coming out of, of e ecologists and anthropologists, how forests think, do glaciers listen, do what do plants teach us. And by this range of movements, I'm suggesting that we're penetrating to the ground level of the cause of this dream gone mad. Namely, materialism is not just stuff. Materialism is the essence of life, but we need to reclaim that essence of life as living, not as dead. As living, not as dead. This is the power of indigenous peoples. I'm not idealizing them either, but it's the power of an indigenous worldview that has held that sensibility for eons, which means most people on this planet have lived with that sense of a living cosmology before modernity. So we recover, we revitalize, we bring in the holistic sciences and ecology, we create the tremendous possibility here, you see, but we have to identify if we're going to say, this is all dead, it's a, it's a dead end. So, um, and let me give you the most striking example of this, and each one of you would have your own. The sense of a dead matter means the universe is basically composed of random, uh, purposeless processes that amount to a mechanism that we can understand by our science and so on, by our laws. But the whole thing adds up to randomness, purposelessness. We have got to take this in, because that is the secular religion our students are given. Why are they schizophrenic? Why are they in despair? Why are people turning to drugs and alcohol to <coughs> soothe the pain of living in a meaningless universe? Viktor Frankl got it right. Man searched for meaning even in the camps. In the Holocaust days, the most powerful drive is the search for meaning and purpose and connection. So here's the story. We finish Journey of the Universe. It goes on PBS, which is sort of amazing when you consider it. this is about evolution, folks. <laughs> it's there for three years, a little under the radar screen. Everything we're trying to do is like ninja. Oh, it's here. And this is part of what we need to do. We need to be great ninjas. So here's the confrontation that I was hoping to avoid by, by doing something which says universe, earth, and human are part of a vast, evolving process, how thrilling, how wonder-inducing, and therefore life-protecting can this be? You see? Great story for the great work, inspiration for the perspiration on the ground. <coughs> Carl Anthony, great eco-justice guy, speaking in the conversations about why this transformed his life and his work on Eco Justice. So, I'm sitting there at Yale. The films come out. We're exhausted. <laughs> and these two scientists, great scientists and friends, were having lunch. And they said, Mary, why did you do this film? And John and I kind of sat there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and all of these universities, either great or small, are within a reductionist framework, right? So I said, well, maybe, possibly, to think about or to consider the <laughs> possibility that we live with, in a universe of meaning and or purpose, they went ballistic. <laughs> Seriously. There's no meaning, and certainly there's no purpose. Teleology is a very 
vexed idea and term and so on. I understand that. But that Stephen Jay Gould, two magisterians, science, religion, it's fine. And scientists have said to me and other people, they said, well, I'm fine in the meaningless universe. I'm, I'm fine with your fineness. <laughs> 90 percent of the world would like to imagine that they live within processes that are emergent, self-organizing, dynamic, transforming. How did we go from a process of lesser complexity to greater complexity? This is extraordinary. We haven't got the faintest idea what the purpose and meaning is, but at least we've got to explore it, right? Whether it's from religious traditions or not, that's the explosion of the knowledge we have for the first time that even our parents didn't have. That we are in a cosmogenesis. How thrilling. How thrilling. Our great great grandparents had no idea about this. And it's a challenge, and it will continue to be a challenge. But that story just really sticks with me. You see? Um, because I see our students who are so fantastic and who are themselves feeling this brokenness of a dream, a brokenness of a world that doesn't make sense to them, and a brokenness of a cosmology that is completely shattered for grounding their life. Why do we have suicide on these campuses? You see? So, I'm not trying to over-dramatize this either, because I think we have amazing resources to answer this. I'm just trying to elevate what's already present, I think, here, and many of your thinking, and so on, and just say, so it's not just a question of a new story, you know, some of you tell me if you're like, the new story, etc. There's many stories that are emerging to recalibrate, reframe the sense of dream, of meaning, of horizons, of action. And I would say this broader context that's needed, especially for our religion and theology <coughs> discussions and movements, because religions have been holders of cosmology and ecological sensibilities for millennia. And I'll speak about that a little bit uh, more. But, um, See, they agree with us. <laughs> no, but part of, part of the issue is religions are not just about salvation outside this world and so on, not just about individual uh, human divine relations. They're about how we place ourselves in a meaningful universe with cosmological stories of origin. Why is Genesis so important? Why are people arguing to this day about stewardship and the role of the human? So a cosmological orientation is what religions have given the human. They've also given them a sense of ecological embeddedness in processes. The rituals in India of puja, of flowers being offered, of water being offered, of ghee being offered. These are the elements of the earth itself. These are ecological embodiments for the human. So cosmology and ecology is already there. So what I want to suggest is cosmology, by the way, the physicists will say they own cosmology. <laughs> they said it to us over Journey of the Universe. I said, sorry. <laughs> you know, cosmology is the story of meaning in relation to an unfolding universe. Um, so ecology, they also think that they own it through the study of ecosystems. Our school gives degrees in management, a master's of environmental management. If we think we can manage these systems, <laughs> <laughs> stunning. You see, it's part of this mentality. I'm like, no, ecology has been the characteristic of peoples throughout cultures and civilizations. Let's raise these up. Let's also transform them to today's world and today's need and for the next generation. Okay, so we have to, to do this. We have lots of resources. I'm just going to go through what I'm calling the new stories, but through a newness of new cosmologies. I'm just going to read them and then we'll go through new science, new ecology, new economics, new politics, new ethics, and new human identity. 
why are we absolutely obsessed with human identity right now? Identity politics, right? Paying attention to that ground beat, that drum beat. Why is it so important? Who are we? See? And we're more than, clearly, our national identity, our ethnic identity, our religious identity. That's why these panels are so important. Symbiosis. Yes, and that's a biological term, <laughs> you see? So, we have these resources to say we can expand who we are. The microcosm, macrocosm, identities, again, in all the world's religions, the atman Brahman relationship, small self, the large self, that's the invitation here, so we don't collapse into a small self that's so small, all we can think of doing is just going to the mall. I think that rhymes. <laughs> um, so, the new cosmology then is a sense that we're moving from dead matter to vital matter. That's why what I've studied from the Chinese tradition is qi. Everything is matter energy. Everything from the galactic star levels to the earth levels to the human level. Why do we have Tai Chi Chi going? We're bringing this energy in, the healing powers of the universe. You see, that's Chi. So this notion of vital matter needs to come into our thinking, our sensibilities, our work, uh, academic and beyond. New science. This is, if you go into the bookstores, this is already there. From reductionism to holism, um, a range of people writing about this, which is, I think, very exciting. A subset of that is new ecology, a ecologist in our building, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, the oldest you know, environmental school in North America. I'm just beginning to get into the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> this colleague wrote a book called New Ecology, and Princeton published it. And they think it's really new. <laughs> but that's good. He's terrific. And I, you know, um, <laughs> I, I gave him, I, you know, I read the book and so on and so forth. He's inspired by Aldo Leopold and the land of ethic and, and whatnot. And then he goes back into this mechanistic language. And almost like we've got to have a war for nature and things like that. Like, oh, let's, let's get the metaphors right. Mm -hmm. See, metaphors are what change us. Um, so this new ecology is from mechanism to system science, um, from the dynamic to the dynamics of ecosystem. So ecology is being redefined. It's not just mechanistic. Um, and integrated ecology is what the Pope is, is speaking about. We've got a new economics, um, from only market capitalism to ecological economics. The founder of ecological economics teaches at Berkeley for 40 years. Dick Norgard, bring him over, discuss this, because he is so convinced that the problem is equity. You see, right in the heart of, of what many of we are trying to do, too, with eco-justice. Um, he's tremendous, but the environment is not an externality for cost accounting. This is at the basis of everything. So we've got the triple bottom line now, economics and human and so on. But the environment, cost accounting, it's happening. It's GRI at the UN, and series and, and so on and so forth. It's happening. So um, <coughs> equality is being redefined in this sense of ecological economics, the inclusion of the environment and people. A new politics. Um, from liberal de uh, democracy of hyper-individualism and individual freedom, which is the legacy of the Enlightenment mentality, which is, again, something we've given around the world. How can we think of ourselves as hyper-isolated individuals? It is the part of this failed American dream. Why I love Confucianism. The individual is always in relationship. The highest virtue is a human in two communities. Everything we've tried to do with many of you in and with religion and ecology is community building, you see? So, um, so from hyper-individualism to communitarian politics of inclusivity. 
socialism is actually back <laughs> on the screen. There's just one person who had the courage to say it, Bernie. You know? Northern Europe has thought through these things a long time. The Scandinavian countries know what equity is, know what dignity is, know the elderly must be taken care of, know the sick must be taken care of, know the poor must be taken care of. So, so fraternity is being redefined. See? Equality and fraternity um, needs to be redefined and also beyond the human to include the earth community. Um, in fact, Lynn Weiss was pointing towards bio-democracy, right? Bio-democracy. And that is <coughs> something that we need to think about. Matt Riley is, is publishing his book, um, hopefully, on that extension of Lynn Weiss' critique to his positive uh, uh, sensibility. So from independence to independence, we are moving in that direction. With, and conflict is part of it, not minimizing that. I have landed in India in a conference in New Delhi with the mosque erupting um, and you know police forces through the hotels and so on and so forth in the Gujarat and Ahmedabad and, and we understand the complexity of the world's religions, as was just demonstrated. But there are Gandhis amidst us. There are Martin Luther Kings amidst us. And the human will move forward with this tremendous sense of nonviolence and peace and equity and the kind of work that is being done on interreligious dialogue here in this room and beyond. So a new ethics is clearly needed. I am so, we talk all the time, it's anthropocentric, it's anthropocentric, and that's true. It's astounding, you see, how inadequate our theology, religions, philosophies are for the sense of interdependence. I'm sitting in a room in a classroom, we're teaching law, environment, and religion. We have eight students from each of these great schools uh, um, at Yale. And we're bringing Peter Raven, the head of the Missouri Botanical Garden, who's a tremendous biodiversity guy, right? And the student who's preparing uh, questions for him says, why should I care about biodiversity? Why should I care if species go extinct? Well, I almost lost it. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. <laughs> and my law colleague was like, whoa. <laughs> but I, I said the same thing. You know, I just said, Here's this institution, here's Yale, and has no way of answering that question adequately. So it's a fair question to ask. But we've got to get to the next stages of this. Think about it. Why should we value species? Well, intrinsic value, utilitarian value, you know, we're going to get medicine from the rainforest of the Amazon, etc. It's still an impoverished sensibility. And people like Dan Scheid and Duquesne are beginning in a book from Oxford talking about a cosmological ethics, a deep time ethics. These species have come out of billions of years of evolution. Isn't that a way to rethink what our ethics is? So biodiversity, how do we value that? Cultural diversity, how do we value that at a moment when both of these are going extinct? Cultures and species? Um, so the new identity for humans, then, is redefining liberty, but equality, fraternity, liberty. These are all the legacies of the Enlightenment. We've got to redefine them. Not to say they're not, they haven't brought us forward, but they're inadequate to where we need to go. Inadequate to where we need to go. So that from anthropocentric to anthropocosmic, Again, this is what these traditions have given us. The Chinese tradition, heaven, earth, and human, the human completes, complements these great cosmological powers. And so if we're talking about alignment of the human with the ecological pulse of the universe, if we're talking about irrigation systems that are measured adequately by the water supply, Chinese tried to do this over time, and I have seen 2,000-year-old water systems that are still in place in China. I've lived in Japan for three years. Irrigation systems are the lifeblood of communities. 
and they have to be sustainable because the community downstream is going to get your waste if you don't. The very small island, you see? And Confucianism is all about an agricultural society so the communities work. Talk about sustainable community models. And that was built into Confucian humane government, governance. So <clears throat> this sense then of an anthropocosmic basis for our thinking and our action, for reimagining what sustainable communities are. Um, so reshaping the dream is part of our task in religion and ecology. It's not only translating texts and imagining if they relate to our present circumstances. That's part of it. But it's something more. And those of us who've been blessed to study these traditions, go to these countries, and or do it right here in our midst, in Oakland or wherever, <coughs> it's like, what is the fire that's going to take that to the next stage? And it's a fire of the, the livingness of these Earth systems, the livingness of the planet. Um, so redefining and expanding the categories, the ideas, the terms in this field. And I like to, to think of it as, you know, a field within academia and a force in the larger society. That force is absolutely unstoppable. In the Climate March 2014, 10,000 of the 400,000 marchers were from religious communities. And here we are in Central Park West, and the religious communities, we, I was with the Yale students, no other faculty came because science is very objective and you don't advocate. <laughs> That's the environment we're working in, folks. Have some sympathy. <laughs> no, but it's, this is part of the mindset, you see. But when all of these religious leaders and white people and so on came in from one of the side streets, the whole march stopped. It was amazing. It was the first time that the religious communities were really present at this climate change march. And Todd Stern, who was our major uh, negotiator for the US down at the UN, he teaches at Yale too. He says to us a week later, he says, everyone at the UN was watching this mark, mm -hmm. march, and also taking note that the religious community was part of it. Mm -hmm. It's a watershed. Um, and it's definitely unstoppable. That's why Standing Rock's unstoppable. But church communities, mosques, uh, temples, and so on, we can do this. Reforestation in the southern India is happening through a temple there. The Chipko movement started, as you know, in the northern Himalayas with women breathing in, talking about breath, the life force, the Shakti, and hugging the trees, which I did this morning with the Redwoods, <laughs> but hugging the trees for the protection of the life of those trees and the water that comes through those mountains. This is the life force that we need to continually regenerate, both for the field and the force. Um, so let me just say um, the intersection then of cosmology and ecology to say it's not just part of the sciences, it's part of the world's religions, identifying it, again, as this Himalaya conference did so beautifully, living landscapes. People in the Himalaya region forever have understood mindscape and landscape are continually interacting. And I offer the word resonance as part of how people have sustained themselves in place with ecosystems that are alive. The mountains in that region. What is Mount Tam in this region? So sacred that Gary Snyder did a mandala pilgrimage around it. Right? The imprinting is so deep, our need to relate that resonance. Um, even at, at this conference in the Himalaya region, of course, it's not just the external world, it's the home. And people like Sarah Schneiderman working on how the home is imprinted with a sense of direction and purpose and cosmology and culture come right down to that level. So we can talk about agricultural festivals, ritual, prayer, pilgrimage. Oh. Sorry. No. <laughs> Thank you. So sorry. Okay. I am going to end then with one story. Thank you. So sorry. Um, last summer.
summer, Ecological Society of America in Baltimore, 10,000 scientists there, two days on ecology and religion, wonderful panels. The president, vice, the past president and future president, endorsed the papal encyclical to say integral ecology is where we need to go. These are the best ecologists in the world. A watershed, you see, that our movement is intersecting with science. They come out on the street ready to go, um, the little holiday in where I was staying. And this gentleman, African-American gentleman, is pouring water into the trees that are in this very urban, sparse environment. I said to I sort of walked up and I said, no chemicals in that, are there? And he said, no, no, just water, just water. And I'm like, oh, that's so great. And he says, these trees are my friends. And he says, I, these are what I care for each day. He works for the hotel. The trees are for, for his own wow. friendship. He said, one of them was about to die over the summer, but someone told him, just keep watering it, let it go, let it continue. And he said, this one I call hope. Um, wow. That's what we need, and may we all have that kind of hope. Thank you. Thank you. 